Good evening. Thank you, everyone. I am um, standing in for, for Linda Hopkins, who um, could not be here. Um, I am Susan Harvey, and I am a member of the Katati City Council, and I do sit on the board, so I will um, do the welcome for Linda then. A welcome and thank you all for coming. Um, this is our second community meeting about a proposed groundwater sustainability fee. We want to apologize for those of you who came January 30th meeting and couldn't find seating or parking. The meeting tonight, plus two more scheduled later this week, are in response to the January meeting, where we realized people needed more time to learn about the fee and to ask questions. Before we get into the meat of the meeting, I want to ask other Santa Rosa Plain Board members, advisory committee members, and members of the agency staff to stand and wave. Do we have, I know we have advisory committee, there we go. Thank you, thank you for your work on that. Um, these folks are available and as will myself be um, to answer questions afterwards. So here's the good news. We finally have a chance to locally make sure that there is enough groundwater for everyone today and into the future. This may not sound like a great big deal, but in California is the last Western state to finally manage their groundwater. The bad news is, is that we have to figure out how to pay for it. The GSA board and its advisory committee have been meeting for over a year to determine a funding system that is legal, politically feasible, equitable, and fair. We've met 14 times to discuss the fee, all in public meetings to talk about the options. In addition, we've had a smaller ad hoc committee that has met many times to work on technical details and to provide feedback to staff and consultants. The purpose of tonight's meeting is to discuss the proposed groundwater sustainability fee and a partner proposal to register groundwater users. You will have an opportunity to provide feedback and ask questions after the presentation, and we are eager to hear your thoughts. I want to make it really, really clear that no decisions will be made tonight. The purpose of the meeting is to share information and hear your feedback. Now I'll turn it over to Valerie Minton Quinto with the Sonoma Resource Conservation District who has volunteered to help facilitate tonight's meeting. And thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Council Member Harvey. And thank you all for being here. Um, before we roll into the, um, the kind of logistics of the evening. Um, I wanna get a sense of who all is here in the room, who's here part of this conversation tonight. So um, if you are a well owner who uses a well, say for home, garden, those kinds of uses, um, can you raise your hand? Oh wow, okay. So that's, that's quite a bit of the crowd here. How about uh, farmers or ranchers using groundwater? Okay, we've, we've got a few of those folks here. And how about anybody who um, lives in a, a, within a city but maybe still uses a well for part of their water use, sort of outdoor water use, something like that? Okay, great, we've got a couple of those. And how about anybody who's in a city and not on a well using city water and just, just here interested? Okay, well, well uh, we've got a, got a good variety here, so I think we'll probably have a, a great, robust set of uh, questions and comments. Um, Please make yourself comfortable. Uh, the restrooms are, if, if you did not see them on your way in, they're kind of straight out back through that lobby area. And there are some snacks and water in the back. Um, I think we, we have a, a, a smaller crowd this evening, so hopefully this won't be an issue, but we do really wanna make sure that everybody has the chance to hear both the presentations and the questions and comments. So please do refrain from, um, you know, from chatter or applause or any of those kinds of things um, during, during those presentations so people can, um, so everybody can hear what's going on. Um, Hopefully everybody has a copy of the agenda and a copy of the PowerPoint presentation um, that you picked up coming through the door. If you didn't, I'm sure we have more copies back there available for you. Um, the agenda for this evening is pretty simple. Um, we'll go through some presentations where you'll learn a little bit about the New Groundwater Sustainability Agency, um, learn about the proposed fee and registration program, and then have a chance to ask questions and make comments. 
Um, we won't be taking questions and comments during the presentations. We'll move through the presentations and then afterwards have a dedicated chunk of time. So if you have questions or comments, uh, you know, feel pre free to take down notes um, so that you remember those things so that you can share them during the, during the question and comment period. Um, I'll reiterate again that, that no decisions are being made here tonight, um, but we do want to collect feedback and get that feedback back to the board. We have a note taker, um, we have comment cards where you can submit written cards either during or after the meeting, and all of those will make it into um, a summary of the meeting that'll be posted online. The meeting materials are also posted online. And finally, this meeting is being taped, and so that recording will be posted online uh, as well. Um, please remember to keep your uh, remarks respectful. Um, board members, advisory committee members, and staff have worked hard for more than a year to come up with a proposal that is fair, efficient, and legal. Um, they understand that people may not be happy, um, but, but please um, keep it as respectful as, as you can within your comments. Um, we will move to our first speaker, who is Jennifer Burke, Interim Director of Santa Rosa Water, a member of the advisory committee. Uh, Jennifer participated in the precursor to the GSA, the Santa Rosa Plain Groundwater Basin Advisory Panel, and she's deeply involved in local water issues. Great, thank you. Um, so I, I did want to just um, echo some of the comments made by Director Harvey. Thank you all for coming out tonight. We really appreciate your time and interest in this and definitely interested in hearing feedback. As was mentioned, um, I work for the City of Santa Rosa Water Department, and I also represent the City of Santa Rosa on the advisory committee. So always interested in the feedback from the public, so we're making sure we're representing uh, what folks are interested in. I'm gonna try and go through this relatively quickly, because I know we're here to talk really about the fee, but wanted to give a little bit of background information. So as folks may recall, in 2014, we're sort of in the height of a historic drought in California. It greatly affected our area, but it also affected uh, the whole state of California. And in particular, policymakers, the governor, legislators were seeing pictures like this that showed impacts to uh, groundwater basins. In particular, this is from uh, the Central Valley where it showed significant land subsidence due to overpumping of groundwater in a very quick period of time. So these kind of pictures, as well as the drought and an interest in maintaining and sustainably managing our water resources, led the legislature and the governor to eventually sign the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act of 2014. So the good news is in Santa Rosa Plain, we don't have the same issues that are occurring in other groundwater basins. We're not seeing the critical overdraft issues in the Central Valley and other communities. But we do know that we want to manage this groundwater basin not only for our current residents, but our future communities. And it's really important for us to make sure that we have this resource available. A recent study by the USGS was completed in 2014 and found that on average, we do pump more out of the groundwater basin that is recharged back into the basin. So it's really important, not only from the information we learned from the study, but it's also important due to recent extreme weather events like the atmospheric river we just had last week and one that we're gonna have again probably starting tomorrow as well as droughts, that it's really important for us to manage our groundwater basin and continue to make sure we have this resource available to us. As I mentioned, protecting groundwater is critical because we know that this particular basin supplies groundwater not only for folks uh, for their everyday needs. Uh, we have a number of, of rural residential folks that are on groundwater. We also have uh, those that depend on groundwater for their livelihood. Um, as was mentioned, there's farmers, um, there's ranchers, um, there's a number of different needs for groundwater. So we need to make sure that we're protecting not only the quantity, but the quality of our groundwater. So this kind of leads us to the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act and what we've done in Sonoma County. In particular, we're here for that blue basin, that's the Santa Rosa Plain Basin. And uh, this, area was very interested in being proactive and making sure that we maintained local control of our groundwater basin. The Sustainable Groundwater Management Act that was um, approved or passed into law in 2014 um, 
really made it so that we had to manage our groundwater basin. It is now state law, and it's important for us to make sure that we are in compliance. It was of strong interest of all the local leaders that we maintain control of this resource locally. So that is why we did elect to and formed a groundwater sustainability agency for each of the three basins that have to comply with the law so that we could maintain that local control and also so that we could work together to manage the groundwater basin and take advantage of any cost efficiencies that we could. So we did form the GSA for the Santa Rosa Plain um, by the deadline of June 30th of 2017. And so, whoops, there we go. That GSA represents a very uh, a varied list of different stakeholders. There are nine board members on the GSA. Director Harvey is one for the uh, city of Katati. And we also have a 17-member advisory committee. Um, on your agenda, you'll see the, the, those that are the members of the board as well as the representatives of the advisory com committee. And between these two groups, they're really interested in making sure we're representing all of the various interests and needs for groundwater, um, not only from the local individual all the way up to the needs of supplying for towns or cities. Since the GSA was formed in 2017, there have been 21 public meetings, and of those 21 public meetings, either at the advisory committee or at the board meetings, 14 of those meetings have been discussed we've had some discussion about the fee. So where are we right now? Right now we are focused on step two, which is development of the groundwater sustainability plan. And the groundwater sustainability plan is really sort of the heart of the law. We're required to develop this plan to show how we will achieve sustainability of our groundwater resource um, 20 years after we adopt the plan. And we must develop and adopt the plan by January 31st of 2022. So we are working on that process right now. If you're interested in participating and giving input on that plan, please come to any of the advisory committee or board meetings because it is discussed there. And I do also want to note that we have been looking at ways that we can help offset the costs for developing this plan, one of which was applying for a, a grant from the state, and we did receive a $1 million grant to help with the development of the groundwater sustainability plan. So um, in terms of the plan, just wanted to give a little bit more information. It's a, a detailed roadmap for how we're going to uh, manage and protect our groundwater resource. And there are a number of things that we're gonna sort of, the six indiv sustainability indicators that we're looking at, um, water quality, land subsidence, groundwater levels, groundwater storage, seawater intrusion, and the balance between groundwater and surface water. So um, it's a lot of information that we're developing, really making sure that we're achieving all these uh, sustainability indicators and protecting our groundwater resource. So now, with that short background, I'm gonna hand it over to Andy Rogers. He's the um, uh, executive director, I probably said that wrong, administrative director of the GSA, and he's gonna talk a little bit more detail about the fee. Thanks, Jennifer. I think the official title is administrator, for whatever whatever that means. But uh, I am uh, again Andy Rogers. Um, I am a geologist by education and by practice and profession. I've had a specialty, I guess, in groundwater and surface water uh, for my career, and I never imagined I'd be doing something like this. To be quite honest. But it is, it is about the most challenging and the most interesting and the most important thing that I've probably done in my 30 years. I've been in Sonoma County for, for all of those years. My family lives on a rural residential property in the basin. I have a well from the 1940s that I take care of. I understand what that's, what that's all about. Um, I'm really honored to be here today working with this initiative. It's important we get this right. Um, bottom line, we have a state law to comply with. We has, have an incredibly important shared resource to take care of. And as Jennifer um, and Director Harvey mentioned, we want local control and because we, we want to have the ability to bring the highest value at the lowest cost to do what we need to do. 
I want to be clear as I possibly can today so you have an understanding of what is so something that's pretty complex. Um, hopefully that you walk away with having a better understanding than when you walked in. Um, thankfully, I'm really uh, lucky to be surrounded by a lot of really smart people. Our board is very, very engaged. So on the, on the agenda you see there, those folks aren't just sitting there nodding, they're really working on this and they really care. And they are really hard on us to make sure we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. Our advisory committee is a 17 member committee, same thing. Just more detailed, more technical, technically focused. You have a really powerful agency that is uh, started um, that I want you to take advantage of. Um, I'm gonna be talking about the proposed groundwater sustainability fee, and I really appreciate you being here and having your attention, and whether you believe it or not, I really look forward to and really need to have your input. This is something our board wants to hear. They wanna hear what we think, they really wanna hear what you have to think. So um, please, please uh, share those in writing, um, and we're gonna give you an opportunity to speak today, follow up with us directly. Uh, there's a lot of people involved. There's peop other people in the room. Please, uh, please mingle as you can. So uh, there has been a lot of questions when we had our Ju uh, January 30th meeting that has, um, has been explained. There are three basins that were identified by the state of California and Sonoma County to form a groundwater sustainability agency, the Petaluma Valley, the Sonoma Valley, and the Santa Rosa Plain. And so the question is, why is the Santa Rosa Plain talking about this fee thing when Petaluma Valley and Sonoma Valley are not? Well, there's a number of reasons. One of them is pure ec economics. So what we're talking about with the Santa Rosa Plain uh, would be double or more of the fee to, to the Sonoma Valley and Petaluma Valley because there just aren't that many people, there aren't that many, as many residences, there aren't as many businesses, there isn't the intensive use that there is in the Santa Rosa Plain. So there's that. The other reason, the other main reason, and there's a lot of reasons, is that we have a significant diverse stakeholder group in the Santa Rosa Plain, a lot more municipalities, uh, and a lot of get engagement. And so we have the opportunity in the Santa Rosa Plain to do this right, given a very, very diverse set of, state, set of stakeholders. So I wanna kinda cut to the chase. Um, and so what is this fee? And you've probably seen some written materials about it. So what is this fee? And so it's based on, and I'm gonna go into a lot of detail about it in a second, but bottom line, it is a combination of, of actual use, known use, so big users like municipalities, wineries, uh, uh, independent water suppliers, they've been measuring groundwater use forever. For decades, they have to report it to the state, so we know what uh, they have used historically over a long period of time, so those are the measured um, actual uses. And then everybody else, which is most everybody else, they're based on estimated use. We're not out to go and find out exactly what you're, you're using. We're here to uh, share with you what m most of the rest of the West has done, is go on, on studies and things that have been conducted to estimate roughly about what, what, based on a land use, what on a zoning type, what is the groundwater use and get your feedback and find out if that is correct or not. So basically, a fee is based on, an, and so an acre foot is a measurement of water that you'll hear a lot about. An acre foot is roughly 326,000 gallons. I didn't come up with that number, but that's a long established term for that amount of water. So we're gonna be talking about in terms of acre feet. Um, we're still working on the, on the final numbers but the lowest rural residential fee, because I saw a lot of hands go up for that, we're looking at something in the neighborhood of $8, and it could be as high as 13. It's likely to fall somewhere in between. So if you're a homeowner with a well, and use your water for drinking, irrigating, your landscaping, and watering your garden, you would pay between $8 and $13 for, as a rural resident. 
for larger groundwater users like farm, farmers, cities, golf courses, et cetera, and other kinds of businesses. The fee would be as low as $16 per acre foot per year pumped annually and a high of 26. And so I'm going to go into more details with this, but I wanted to give you a one-pager one about what we're talking about here. The other, th the other uh, piece that I want to make sure you understand is uh, this fee would be uh, stay the same for three years. So this is not something that next year we're going to be at, uh, talking about this again. This is going to be established for three years. At that time, our GSA board can take it up again and either get rid of the fee, change the fee uh, at that time, because we'll have our groundwater sustainability plan at that time. So a little more detail. Um, so if the, if the sustainability fee is approved, the fee would go into effect beginning this July and would be collected on the property tax bills. We want to make it crystal clear even though it's showing up on the property tax bill, this is not a property tax. And I know that is semantics to a lot of folks because it's more money going to a government. So it sounds an awful lot like a tax. But this is based on groundwater use. So there's some parcels that are not going to get any assessment. Others have a, a residence on the property or maybe a dairy has a, has a residence on the property. So there's going to be fees based on the use. So that's why it is a fee, it is not a tax. So again, just a little bit more about kind of the estimated versus actual. How do we know how much groundwater people use? And like I said already, we have a lot of data on the public water systems, cities, towns, wineries, et cetera, which are already reporting their use to the state. The vast majority, though, like I said before, are we don't know how much um, folks are using. Um, and we're not out to find out um, specifically, but this is a really common approach, and this is new to us here, but it's not new to most of the rest of the, of the Western states. So the, for these reasons, groundwater managers have used uh, these estimates, and I'm going to tell you about where they come from in a minute. So there's this thing called a rate. And the best way to describe what I'm talking about with a rate is we need a unit of measurement to talk about um, how much we, the, this fee, what, this, what is this fee based on? So I'm going to be saying two key words. One is when I'm talking about a rate, and the other one is when I'm talking about a fee. The rate helps determine what the fee is. So what is, what is a rate? Um, so. The average, average annual cost of running the Groundwater Sustainability Agency. And I'm going to have a slide that kind of details that out in a second. Divided by the acre feet of groundwater used an annually. And as, as uh, Jennifer Burke mentioned, there's been intensive study that's been going on for uh, probably 15 years before uh, this, this, this law was signed in 2014 to determine these things. And I, I have some information on what that estimate is as well. Equals the rate. So basically, the cost of the GSA divided by how much water is extracted from our basin gives us this rate. So the Groundwater Sustainability Agency there was an estimate done a couple years ago when this was formed in 2017, June 30th of 2017, that the next five years were going to cost, uh, cost uh, $3 million, essentially. And that's not just to run the agency. That was to prepare the groundwater sustainability plan, to do all the things that we need to do to comply with state law. The member agencies that are on your, uh, on your agenda there paid for the first two years to get through those two years, and they have decided to defer repayment of that money till a future time. In the meantime, because like I said, we have a lot of smart people working on this project, our staff was able to secure a million dollar grant from the state to help write this uh, groundwater sustainability plan for us. So 
A lot of talk about unfunded mandates again. Well, we went and got some funding for it. And so that is a tremendous help financially. That leaves about a million dollars for the five-year time span divided by the three years we have left. So we're trying to fund $337,000 per year for the next three years. So that's the amount of money we're trying to finance, essentially. So how is this calcul... Oh, so let me uh, some go back. So going back to what is the, the rate based on, now we know what the average annual cost of running the GSA are, and I'll do a spoiler alert on myself. The acre feet of groundwater used annually in the basin is roughly 17,000 acre feet per year, equals a little less than $20. So the rate that I'm gonna be talking about is, a, is I'm just gonna use $20. It's like 1950 or something like that. So that's the rate that we have currently to work with. So, how is the groundwater sustainability fee calculated? So again, the amount of groundwater used annually in the basin times the rate equals the fee paid. So if we do the, the calculation in reverse of what I just said, that'll come up to, uh, the, which is the 17,000 times the 20 equals the, the 337 a year. So. This same calculation is used to figure out what is the fee that we want to assess the groundwater users. It's the exact same calculation, but with different inputs. So that yellow line is gonna serve as the, essentially the $20 mark. So that's the rate. So for rural residents, I've been talking about the studies. Uh, we can't just come up with a random number out of nowhere and just say, Rural residents use about a half acre of, of ground, a half acre foot of groundwater annually. We have to base it on, on founded studies, and I think we have four, maybe five that we have referenced, and they all hover around this number. And we totally believe and know, because I'm one of them, there are a lot of people that use less than that in this basin. But we also know there's a lot that, based on these studies, that use a lot more. So the average comes out to be a half acre foot for rural residents. Times, again, doing the calculations. So the $16 per foot is a low range. So what I'm doing is, again, the $20 is that yellow line. So as we refining our numbers, if we can save some money on the GSA costs, or if we are able to find more um, inputs into it to be more efficient, um, the, it's going to be a $16 per acre foot low range equals about $8 uh, per parcel annually. So that's where the $8 comes from. On the other side of the $20 line, we have our half acre feet times the $26. So we're saying between, somewhere between $16 and $26 is going to be the rate. And we think it's going to fall around the 20 mark. We want to give you a range, though, because we don't want this to suddenly be different than what we said tonight. So it's going to fall somewhere in there. So that equals on the high side, the 13. So there's the range of the 8 to the 13 for the rural residents. And that's how it's calculated. For municipalities, kind of the other end of the spectrum, because we, we got a lot of comments, why aren't the larger users you know, paying the majority and paying a lot more than, than us poor residents. And they, do, they are. So again, they've got decades and decades of very well metered uh, documentation that they submit to the state. And so the city of Santa Rosa, I'm using this as an example, but this is true for all the municipalities. 1,598 acre feet of water are pimp. Still that one? Hello. Oh, there we go. Must be a battery thing. Okay. I'll hold it. Can you hear me? Oh, yes.
So again, um, here we have the range. The $20 rate line is the yellow line. So for the low range, we have $16. So on the low side, Santa Rosa is going to pay um, a little over $25,000. On the high side, using these same numbers, 16 to 26, they'll pay close to $42,000. So that's the range for the city of Santa Rosa. So grape grower example. So this is a little bit more complicated because there are a lot of established factors for what types of crops are grown in what area that the Department of Water Resources uses. And so that was brought in. Then we established a focus group to see what was locally for what was real. And so what this is an example of is if there was 100 acres of irrigated grapes. So the factor per acre per year is 0.6 acre feet of water per acre per year. Multiplied by 100 acres gives you 60 acre feet times, again, the, between the 16 and the 26 with the rate in the middle that I was talking about equals $960. So again, a different ball game than a rural resident. So here's the same calculation for the grape grower with 100 acres of uh, irrigated grapes times the high side. So it could be as high as 1560. And again, it probably will fall somewhere in between. So what if we don't do this? The state already has their schedule of fees, and they're very, they put it out there. So if we don't do something and get our, our basin understood and managed with those six through those six indicators that Jennifer talked about, we have to report them back. The state intervenes and takes over. And so we ha what we have in the center column is what I just went through, except for, and I'll talk about the third one in just a second. But the state will levy $300 on every uh, parcel owner, hard $100 for, plus $100 for rural residences, and so, and, and then 40 acre per, $40 per acre foot, when we're probably in the 20 range. So a lot more money. And it, that, it gets a little worse. That doesn't include the groundwater sustainability plan. We still would be on the hook for preparing the groundwater sustainability plan. So the state, the board was not interested in going the, uh, the state route, have them come in and do this. And I don't think anybody would be happy about that. I certainly wouldn't. So again, this is the comparison if the state took over versus us taking control locally. And being in Sonoma County, I know we like to manage our things. And obviously, by your presence and by your caring for this and having concerns, you're engaged. And that's why this is going to work. Okay. Getting so hard ahead of myself. So hopefully we can go over any of this stuff again in questions for the, um, for the rate, but hopefully that was helpful to at least see how we're figuring this stuff out. We're not making it up. It all has to be based on stuff. It has to be legal, it has to be fair and equitable. All those things are incredibly important. And so your input is going to help us make it work. Um, the other part to why we, ha where we have to go with this, how do we do this? Well, rural residents, why can't we just leave them alone, right? I know I hear that. I'm one also. Why do, why do we have to bring in rural residents? Well, what the groundwater management plan uh, figured out is that rural residents and what's called, and I'm going to describe it later, and it's a fancy Latin term, de minimis user, I'd just rather say a minor user, um, a minimal user, um, are 24% of the overall extraction. So I mentioned 17,000 acre feet is extracted from a basin every year. 24% of that are from de minimis or minimal or, or rural residential users. So the only way that we can assess a fee to include that so it's fair and equitable and nobody's subsidized, 
is that we have to regulate them. Well, our eyes all rolled when we learned that. And so how, what, how can we do a regulation that is the least intrusive, the most simple, um, and actually has some value and benefit? So what we have right now is what we're calling the Groundwater User Registration Program. I kind of like to call it the Groundwater User Participation Program, but we're calling it the Registration Program for the time being. So what is this thing, and how does it work? So owners of parcels that are assumed to use groundwater are going to get, a, if this all gets approved, they're going to get a letter from the Groundwater Sustainability Agency. And again, if anybody lives outside of that basin boundary, this doesn't apply to you. It's just the folks who have property within the basin boundaries. Um, we're gonna, the, the letter is going to have the parcel number, the address, the parcel size, and the type of land use. And the type of land use, again, as you saw, kind of helps us determine what we believe you're using. What our staff is doing their, um, their best at is taking all the information and data sets that exist to do the most homework to include what we know about the groundwater use where you are. We, we know we're not going to get everything right, but we're trying to vet out as much as possible. Some parcels are driveways. Some parcels are just, you know, corners on a, on a, on a road. You know, that, that's silly. There's no groundwater use. And there are, there's, there's users that we might have in our files that maybe you don't use groundwater. So if the information is correct for what we send you, you don't really need to do anything. If you'd like to do something about it, and we'd like more information if we could get it. So this is an opportunity to provide that. It's like, well, wait a minute. I want to prove to you that um, I'm a really good groundwater user. And here's my well depth. Here's where it's located. And I only use this much a year. That could be a real benefit to us in the future. Some folks have you know, measure the levels because they don't want their pumps to daylight, things like that. That all is helpful information. You don't have to provide it, but we're, it, we're going to make it so that you can provide it. We also are going to get some things wrong, and so this is an opportunity to correct what we said to you. So here's what we know. You tell us something different, and then we can correct our information. So that is essentially what the groundwater user registration program is. Again, kind of the least intrusive thing we could possibly come up with and still meet the definition of regulating um, uh, de minimis users. So a couple things, actually a number of things that we've heard over and over, and I'd probably have the same thoughts, are um, what this program is not. So. We are not requiring meters. We have no plans to require meters on wells. As a matter of fact, the state law doesn't allow us, even if we wanted to require meters for, again, the minimal users, de minimis users, the rural residents. So that is not on the table. We're not requiring groundwater users to monitor their water. But there are voluntary programs in neighborhoods, and they're keeping their track. Absolutely, participate in those and, and monitor away. If you wanted to share the information with us, we'd love to have it. So we're not requiring you to fill out forms unless you want to share or correct our information. Um, the other piece is, is that um, if you, this new agency sounds so new, I'm not going to call those guys. I don't know who they are. But you know what? I know this guy at the Ag Commissioner's office that I feel comfortable talking about. Well, we're engaging with the Ag Commissioner and Permit Sonoma, so they're available to talk to folks, to interface. If you're used to talking to a, uh, somebody at one of those agencies, um, we're, we're giving them the tools they need to help to talk to folks about this. Um, and then, of course, we are always available as well. So this is a little bit uh, texty here, but Sigma, again, is, this, is the law that we've been talking about. Um, I've already kind of described. So uh, we have to 
regulate a de minimis user if we're going to assess a fee. The reason we're doing that, if it was a tiny, tiny percentage of the extraction, we probably wouldn't go there, but it's 24%. So we need to go there. Um, so again, the, the definition of de minimis, and again, I'm not a fan of that term, but two acre feet a year. So 652,000 gallons a year. Anybody that number or less is considered a de minimis user. This program, the registration program, or participation program, could provide important information to us about areas. And so if we need to respond, if we do have more stressed uh, basin conditions in the future, which I imagine at some point we will, sure doesn't seem like that's gonna be the case these days, but you know, 2015 wasn't very long ago. And again, I just wanna repeat that the law does not authorize us to meter de minimis users. So, kind of what's next? So tonight, I'm really hoping that you've, you've gotten some information that's helpful so you can understand what we're doing. We wanna make darn sure that you hear what we're trying to do. If it doesn't make sense, we hope we'll have follow-up on that and that so you do understand, because that's the one of the most critical. Our board is not only wants us to be transparent, but they want us to engage. And so thank you for being here for engage, to engage with us. So what happens from here is we're having, we had a meeting on um, January 30th in this room, and then we have tonight, and then we're meeting in Rohnert Park, doing the same, um, same exact materials Wednesday night, and then we're in Windsor Thursday night doing the same thing at the same time. And both of those are in council and town chambers. And that information's on our website. So we're gonna package up all the input we get and bring it to our board and say, here are the things that we've come up with. We've told a, a lots and lots of people, here's what we heard back. So our board, again, if you, have, if you live in a certain area and you have a connection with one of your board members, there's another place for input, but it's really important that we hear that so we can put it in the context of our proposal. So we had this idea, nobody likes this idea. We had this idea, this was like, yeah, I can, that, but that's reasonable. So we can provide that kind of feedback. So on March 14th, we're scheduled to have a board meeting to possibly consider the methodology of the fee. So what, what I just described, those calculations, how we came up with rate, how we came up with the fees for the various user types. Those are the kinds of things that we're gonna talk about and our board's gonna consider whether they want us to tweak it, whether they wanna approve it, that kind of thing. So that's on March 14th. We're not sure exactly when the next meeting uh, will be for that there needs to be another hearing for um, adopting a fee and approving the registration program. So that's either gonna be on April 11th or it'll be at a future May or June, June date, and our website will keep you up to date on, on when those are. So that's what's happening next. And it's a long URL for our, our website, but it's a good website, I think. Um, one of the future enhancements we're gonna have, which I know will be very helpful, is we're gonna have an interactive map. So you can click on it and, I, in, and you either add in your APN or your address, and it'll, the map will go there to show you are you in or out or straddling the basin boundaries. Those basin boundaries were not things that we drew. These things were drawn by, the, the, by geologists in the 70s, um, and so that's why they, they look so weird. They don't follow any city, uh, city boundary. Um, so that's, it's based on surface geology. So we know it's really important because it's really hard to see on even these giant maps where your parcel is and do I have a little corner that sticks in it or, or not. So we're gonna have that available to you pretty soon as well. So with that, I wanna turn it back to Valerie. Okay, well thank you Andy and Jennifer for your presentations. Um, thank you all for your attention. 
um, during all that information. Um, as you know, as we've mentioned multiple times, I think the purpose of this evening is both to to fill you in with the information on what's going on, and then also to hear your uh, answer your questions, hear your comments. So now we're moving into that kind of second phase of the evening. Um, we will be keeping time during comments. Each person will have two minutes to comment, and the purpose of that is to make sure that everybody gets the chance to ask their questions, uh, give their comments. Anne up front here um, will be timing, um, and she'll have a little a little sign um, for folks uh, to let them know um, when their time is coming to a close. Uh, there's a microphone up here at the front, so folks that wish to comment, um, please just line up behind the microphone. That'll really keep things rolling quickly if we have the next person in line ready to go. Um, if you have clarifying questions, we can um, ask staff to answer those. So I'll, I guess I, I should invite uh, the staff that are here to answer questions to, to um, head up to the microphones so that if there are clarifying questions, um, you can answer those. Um, if you do not wish to speak your comment out loud but have something you want to say, um, you can fill out a comment card and those will all be compiled as well. Um, let's see what else. I mentioned this earlier, but of course, um, there are lots of people in the room that probably have varying viewpoints. Um, so just please uh, try to keep your comments as respectful as possible to the viewpoints of others. Um, we will uh, we will wrap this up just a couple minutes before eight, so that we make sure that we get everybody out on time. We said the meeting would end at eight, but then there will be um, staff and advisory committee members and others that'll hang around a little bit later. So if if folks have follow up questions beyond that, um, so I think that is it on logistics. Um, so please, if anybody has questions or comments, feel free to to step forward to the microphone. Oh, yes. Oh, of course. I'm sorry. You haven't, you haven't met all of these lovely folks up here. You met uh, Jennifer and Andy, but we also um, have a couple of other GSA staff that I will allow to introduce themselves. My name is Jay Jaspers, uh, and I'm the plan manager for this GSA. I also uh, work for the Sonoma Water, Sonoma County Water Agency as chief engineer and director of groundwater management. I'm Marcus Trotta. I also uh, work for uh, Sonoma Water. I'm a geologist, and I also serve as staff to the, the Santa Rosa Plain GSA, uh, primarily working on uh, technical aspects of uh, developing the, the groundwater sustainability plan. Say your name again. Marcus Trotta. Thanks, guys. I think we're ready. We're ready to go. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Mike Martini. I live in Santa Rosa, but I operate a well within the basin. Um, Mr. Rogers, I appreciate the uh, additional information regarding why this basin is uh, considering the uh, adoption of fees at this time while the other two basins are not. Um, you point out that very clearly that it's the cost of operating the basin divided by the, uh, the number of users. But what you don't do is you do not compare the cost of operating this basin with operating the other two basins. It is my understanding that this basin chose to go outside of the area to bring uh, you on uh, to, to administer as opposed to using uh, staff from the water agency or staff from any of the municipalities. In addition, the other two basins chose not to pursue a rate study at this time, so those numbers aren't put in there. And there's also a um, legal fees that this basin is spending uh, well in excess of the other two. So that when you go back and you actually take a look at comparing apples to apples, we're still asking one basin to pay fees in, in the uh, county, but the other two are not. It is also my understanding that of all of the basins that are under consideration, only two others are adopting fees at this time, Salinas, and I believe there's another one uh, down in Southern California. And both of those are very tight agricultural communities that already have agricultural water districts and they're, they're doing the fees themselves. I just remind you very quickly, you know, recently the city of Healdsburg adopted housing fees and one of the big pushbacks about those housing fees was one third of those dollars raised for affordable housing were going to administration. I urge this body to think about product. We know we're going to spend money in preserving our groundwater. Spend the money on product and not on process. Hi, 
My name is Cher Ennis, and I'm a little confused about the information on slide, num on slide 21. Up until then, I was following along great. I get the whole charge per acre foot for agricultural municipal golf courses and for rural residential, but suddenly there's a new category that's added in, which is the urban supplemental, and there's no explanation of what that is. So could you explain that? Yeah, thank you for pointing that out. I completely meant to loop back and, and talk about that. So what that is essentially is if somebody, and I think there was, uh, Valerie called out if there was anybody out there, where if you lived in a city or are connected to a, a water supply system and also had a well, essentially. So that's the one to three dollar range one. Great, that makes sense and that's me, so thank oh, you. Welcome. Hi, I'm Mary Barsoni. I live in West County and in California and I'm very interested in groundwater issues. And my question to you is it's called a groundwater sustainability plan. And you mentioned that we're already drawing more water annually than is replenished naturally in our basin. So how are we going to tackle that? So that's something that, that, uh, that is um, laid out in the, uh, in the state law is uh, how um, is one of the requirements of uh, these GSAs is they need to develop these groundwater sustainability plans. The plans need to characterize conditions in the basin, look at the water budget, how much is going in, how much is going out. Uh, and then they need to go through the process of setting thresholds, measurable thresholds for things like groundwater levels to ensure that we're not lowering our groundwater levels um, over time to make sure there's not um, surface water depletion, things like that. And so th those thresholds are going to be set and then if it's determined that uh, we're not meeting those thresholds, then the plan needs to include projects and actions that would uh, allow us to achieve the, the sustainable um, criteria and objectives that will be set. And so those projects and actions can include additional conservation measures, recharge projects, um, increased use of recycled water to offset groundwater pumping, things like that. So those will all be considered and vetted through the process of preparing the groundwater sustainability plan over the next several years. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Susan Ball. I am uh, somebody, a rural homeowner with a well and I um, went to the last meeting that we did the 350 plus standing. I was hoping there would be that many this time. I uh, and another gentleman have just founded an organization called Rural Homeowners Alliance because I feel like we are not being um, protected by the city or by your agency. I see no one on your board that cares about the little guy. So we are starting a petition, and I want everybody in the room to know about that. And I will, I will state what the petition says. We're still tweaking it because it's fairly new. The regulatory fees proposed by the Santa Rosa Plain Groundwater Sustainability Agency are based on, we believe, inaccurate and biased estimates. Instead of locally derived, verified empirical data, we hereby demand that all those on the board that have vested interest, and we know a few of you do not, and we know many of you do, financial or otherwise, recuse themselves from any further voting until their position can be replaced. We, the underside, demand equitable charges and sustainable solutions. I see no sustainable solutions in your plan at all. Like, where's the gray water systems for development? Where, where are you actually monitoring the use of uh, the industrial I hear you want money, but you're not getting in, you're getting flat rates. I think that is absolutely ridiculous. And protecting the rural homeowners' rights and our local 
food producers. This is the biggest concern I have about your plan, is you are not protecting the food producers. They're going to end up paying a lot of money. And I just found out that your fees are actually legal. We were questioning if they were legal or not, because you have eminent domain to come on our property anytime you want to. And if you're saying that you're not going to meter us, I think that that is not exactly true. In the future, you will be metering us. Hello, my name is Michael Hilbert, and uh, I've been in contact with the Howard Jarvis uh, Taxpayers Association out of concern of your claim to the right to impose a property tax without a two-thirds vote. And I got some comments back from uh, the Taxpayer Association staff attorney, and she detailed some of the, some of the Proposition uh, 26 requirements that need to be met as far as... Um, you know, conferring a benefit and uh, uh, unable to exceed reasonable costs for benefits conferred and details like that. And she also um, related, you know, there's an ongoing lawsuit in Salinas over this. So as, as a takeaway, uh, I, I look at this and think that there's several possible challenges to your, your fee here. And one of them is, I say you're violating the uniformity requirement. And to give you an example, you will charge my neighbor the same as you charge me, because it's an acre rural property, but they have two houses, not one. And they also have people living in a trailer. They put a TV antenna on the trailer so people could watch TV while they live in it. And it also appears that they built some sheds that look like tiny homes that they got people living in. And the other slumlord rental next to me, it had a 6,400 square foot unpermitted marijuana farm on it. And you don't know how much water was used in that, even though it went on for several years. So there's a violation of the, there's a legal requirement for uniformity. So if you're gonna charge me the same as others who may be using several times more, I think that's not, um, that's not de defensible. Hi, uh, my name is Paul Archibald, and I'm uh, on the board of directors of a small mutual water company out in the county, Wendell Lane Mutual Water Company. Uh, we've got only 25 connections. Actually, I think you guys are really courageous <clears throat> to be doing this. Having set up that mutual water company, it was like herding cats. Anyhow, um, my question is about, um, you know, I don't have, so I don't have, we have one well serving 25 homes. How will we get assessed or feed? Um, will each of us get a, a notification in our mail for all 25 of, uh, of us users? Um, but we don't each have a well, we just all get water out of this one system? I mean, how, how does that work? 25 times 25, 20 bucks or whatever? So the, the current approach is that um, because your system is a, a public water supply system, uh, the uh, assessment would likely come to that to the uh, to the mutual water company, and then um, you know it would be up to you to distribute it to you know your your so, so each of us customers end up paying fifty cents a year. Well, so because you're a public water system, um, your usage is reported to the state, and so your your mutual water company would be billed on the actual usage, oh, okay. the acre foot. So it would come in that about um, three and a half, that acre sixteen feet. to twenty six dollar per acre foot uh, charge would be multiplied by the acre foot that's used by your water company. So will we will we um, will we individuals on the in the comp in the distribution will we get a letter from you guys saying something and we'll have to come back and say no we're actually covered by the our water company we'll let, is that what's going to happen do you understand like i mean will i get a letter from so the, the letter the letter should just go to the water company not the individual customers okay. within the water company because what what we're doing is is trying to get information 
on which parcels are covered by existing public water supply systems so that we're not okay. sending, uh, assessing those individual parcels or sending them the letters. It would just go to the entity that's actually providing the water. Gotcha. Good. Yeah, and if, if they, if for some reason folks do get um, a, uh, an assessment when they are under a public water supply system, then that there'd be a, an, you know, an opportunity to, to let us know and there'll be some sort of appeals process that'll be set up for that. I'm Ken Coburn, I'm rural residential, um, hills behind Rohnert Park. And I have a question with regard to what the rate is based on. And it looks to me like um, the estimated five-year costs are $3 million, which would be about $600,000 a year but that's gonna be collected within the first three years. So what's happening to the additional 1.2 million? So the, the three, $3 million is the total operating cost for five years minus what uh, the million dollar grant, minus what the agencies have already contributed to date, who they've said they will defer, which is close to another million. Correct. So it's really 3 million and then divided that by, I mean, one million left, divided by three, then which is where the 337,000 comes from per year for three years. That's what I'm saying. In three years, you'll have collected everything, which will include the expenses necessary for year four and five. Yeah, Correct. that's right. So that's right. at the end of this particular term, the term you'll already have paid for the sums to take care of this for year four and five. That's. I, I think so. I'm, 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 I'm trying to make sure, I want to make sure I give you the that, right answer. Those are yeah. the numbers you gave. So I think I understand your question. We're in year two going on year three. So we've already received the payment for the first two years by the member agencies. The amount that's left is for three, four, and five. Yeah, you'll have 1.2 million left for year four and five. No, we we will. We need 337 a year per year for three, four, and five. That's left to collect. That's what we need to fund. I'm I'm sorry because if we take the 900,000 plus the 1 million, with the plus the 1 million and eight, and if we consider those two first paid, the grant and the deferred funding, then the three years at 337,000 means you're fully paid in three years. I'm sorry? The last two, the last two years will have been paid by the time the third year is over. So this is, this is through year three, four, five. I see. And the Okay. Jane Nielsen for the Sebastopol Water Information Group. <clears throat> um, some of our members have discovered places where um, what look like just rural wells are places where trucks drive up and get filled and after inquiry, after seeing this for a number of times, um, actually asked and discovered that it was uh, water that was being sold to a bottler. And I'm wondering if uh, there are wells like that that are identified and known, if they're licensed or if it's just something the county doesn't know about at all, and if wells like that are taking our groundwater for bottling and selling as if it was spring water, um, are they um, okay? I mean, are they licensed or something? So, um I know that there there's at least one um, water bottler in the, in the in the basin that is uh, permitted through the through the county um, permit resource uh, 
management department so that that user would be included. Um, you know, if there's uh, others that aren't permitted, um, we really have no way of, of, uh, of knowing that. So it's, it's kind of a good point, you know, the, the estimates that we're coming up with in terms of, uh, of groundwater use. These are um, estimates that are based on information that we can, you know, obtain and, and uh, you know, rely, reasonably assume are, are actually occurring. There's likely other uses that, that uh, we don't, that aren't recorded and that, that we don't have a way of knowing about like that one. And so, um, you know, that, that's, that's the type of thing that'll, that'll require some additional, you know, investigation in the future, I think. John Rosenblum. I'm the homeowner and the engineer for Belmont Terrace Mutual Water Company, and for two years we've been trying to join the GSA. We have, hopefully with Sebastopol we will join the GSA. And I'm so gratified that this meeting is full of people who can contain themselves, because really the main reason for me getting up was just to show that there are people in West County who support the sustainability plan. However, the sustainability plan requires collaboration and adequate information. We're willing to collaborate what we're concerned about and our members, our board has voted that each of our homes, homeowners will spend $20 a year for, for years three, four, and five. We're willing to do this because we want sustainable groundwork water. However, when I look at the rural residential, the split between the rural residential and the grape growers, I'm really worried that that split really doesn't work. We're using about 0.38 acres per home. We're on third acre lots, so that means we're when we divide it into per acre, it's one foot or one acre foot per acre, one foot, and it just doesn't seem logical at all using local data that a vineyard can be 0.6. I really like to see local data on that and just not a focus group which we don't know much about. There's enough measurement in the agricultural community to know how much water is really being used. And if we want to be local, we should base it on local. But anyway, I really support the development of the plan. We really want to invest in the development of that plan. We just want to make sure it really is sustainable. I think um, just in response, John, um, I think the studies that the vineyard use uh, were based on in part in addition to the practice group that was developed are on the website and we can certainly provide those references to you also. Hi, my name is Doug Emery. Uh, I uh, am the chairman of Gates Drive uh, Water System, which is a small mutual well of nine members. And we kept water records, we kept our own meter uh, for years, and I have uh, some data that I'll give you here, I copied it out. I also have graphs showing uh, water use over the years. And uh, we use between half of what, between half and three quarters of what you estimate uh, from your three sources. I don't know what, what those sources, they're listed in your pamphlets. But we use, we use much less than, uh, and this data shows that. Uh, so I'm trying to be a scientific, and I value the science of, like I've said before, I value the science of understanding our groundwater. I want to know what's there, where it's flowing, where it's going, just for the, uh, the sourcing and the toxins, and where it's, where it's going outside of our county as well. Uh, anyway, so I'm going to pass this to you in a, in a, in a minute. Um, but uh, I really... Like this last gentleman said, I, I think some, there's a, there seems to be a blind spot to the rural residential user. And I only see about maybe one person on the entire directorship and advisory and everything representing me and our small system. 
Um, and, and I just feel that uh, the use uh, is de minimis. I mean, it's so de minimis with regard and in context of the large exportation of alcoholic beverages, for instance, viticulture, and all, all the event centers and things that go with that whole industry. We just talked about bottled water filling up the tanks, taking our water and selling it for profit. We rural users use it for survivability. It's a public trust. It is our public trust, like breathing air, like mountains and wildness. I mean, it is essential to us to live. And uh, we're comparing that with profiteers in industry. And we're talking sustainability? Is that in a scientific? Is that in a scientific understanding or is it an economic understanding? Are we trying to marry this somehow, the economy of sustainability with livability? And if you think that works somehow to enmesh that, you can just, well, look at, look at what's happened to our resources in the United States, what's happening now. And I know we're under state mandate and you're under pressure, thank you. But I, I, I just, uh, yeah, our time's up. It really is, that's a good one. <laughs> My time's up too. Uh, I just think that uh, this thing's gonna go on and on to regulate and have teeth to this and really bite the bottom of this thing and who's selling this and wasting it and giving it up. We're gonna really have to uh, regulate, which is gonna go on forever. So we're not gonna vote on that, and I just feel that the guy that spoke about the, the taxes, uh, you know, we're never, you're never gonna vote on it once you open the door and you'll see. It's gonna be all the on. I'm just approaching the <laughs> Thank you for providing the information. We know that we can always use more information to be more accurate, so thank you for providing that. Hi, my name is Ron Stennett, and I'm a rural residential well owner in north, northeastern Santa Rosa. And uh, I, I saw as part of the plan, one of the items that was presented had to do with water quality. And I wondered if we're going to be paying these fees, if that would... Uh, bring any kind of protection against, uh, say, a, na a vineyard neighbor who sprays glyphosate uh, closer to my well than I'm very that I'm comfortable with, and uh, I would like to know if there'd be any monitoring of, of that sort of thing. Yes. Yeah. So water water quality is definitely one of the the six uh, criteria that uh, the state requires. Um, us to, to assess in terms of sustainability. So there will be, um, you know, there'll need to be thresholds that are set for water quality components and then a monitoring program to, to track those over time. Would, any, would anyone be answerable to an offense like that? Could you repeat that? I couldn't hear you. Would there be any, any kind of enforcement for the water quality? Well, there's, there's existing enforcement um, from the state water board or the regional water quality control board for mm. things like that. Do they, do they stipulate uh, offsets uh, to wells for that kind of spraying? So if, I would imagine, and, and the plan is still is in development, but it being that being a criteria that we really need to evaluate, having your input to that element as the plan is developed could perhaps point those things out. But there are certainly uh, regulatory enforcement mechanisms that exist now that we wouldn't want to replicate, but perhaps we could you know, fold ourselves in there as appropriate to protecting our groundwater resource. Okay, thank you. Um, a couple notes on, on process here. I just wanna remind everybody in the room, please, um, please refrain from side conversations. I'm hearing it sounds like it's hard for some people in the room to hear all the comments and discussion. 
So if you need to have a conversation, step out to the back or do it after the meeting. Um, I also want to make sure that we give a chance for anyone who hasn't commented yet, uh, make sure we have time for those folks to comment. So if there are any people who haven't yet commented um, and you're planning to, please, um, please uh, stand up and, and line up behind the microphone so we make sure we get to you as well. So I, I came up with a, a question. Um, that a golf course is going to be $16 a year for the water that they, that's $16 a year, right? That's what you're going to be charging them for a golf course? That's what you're, unless I misunderstood. So, uh, uh, Something like a, a golf course, they'd be assessed the. Someone like a golf course would be assessed based on the amount of, uh, of estimated groundwater that they use, and in that sixteen to twenty-six dollar range, that would be per acre foot of water. So, if a golf course is using a hundred acre foot of water, it would be you know sixteen times a uh, hundred would be their their fee for their for their usage. But homeowners are only going to be charged a flat rate. That's correct. And that flat rate is also based on the estimated usage of half an acre foot per year. And is that going to be capped? Like, is there going to be like, oh, this is what we're going to do for the next 20 years? Uh, is it going to be three years? And then what happens after three years? Three years, we have our groundwater sustainability plan, and our board has the option to change the fee, get rid of it, extend it, uh, modify it at that time. But the, what we're talking about is a three-year. So I think I think that you know, instead of becoming adversary to what you guys are doing, I understand that you are guys are trying to do something good for all of us. How you're you're wanting to save you're wanting to monitor water. I'm wanting to keep I'm wanting to make sure that I have water to drink and bathe and everything like that, right? And I'm wanting water to for my grandchildren and my future grandchildren. So so my question is, and I'm just really like scratching my head here, is why why is there nothing about minimizing the usage of water, of potable water. Why is there nothing in the plan about going into, into gray water systems, into, into basically capping the vineyards, about maybe in, in, in 15 years doing all dry farming for the vineyards? Uh, why is where where is this the sustainability plan in your plan? I'm 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 really questioning that and sustainable in the sense of sustainable would be let's not put any more herbicides on our grounds because that is a sustainable solution. Let's move to organic farming through this whole county because that is a sustainable solution for our future, for our water. Where are those plants? So the plan has not been developed. This is But you spent three, th $3 million already. You're not, I don't think of you guys as a very good business people. So the plan has not been developed, but all the, the actions you uh, mentioned and yeah. many others will be deliberated on by the public, by the GSA, and but those will be in some form that makes sense to the community embodied into the plan to meet the six but, undesirable results, which right. include water quality, water levels, and the others. But and you that need will money. Be part, that you will need, be part of you the need plan. money to do this. We, we, ma am, ma am. we need money to do this, right? So, That's right. So, Ma'am, you've used your time for comments, and I think uh, it's time to make sure that other folks in the room get the chance I'm just, to comment. I'm as just well. trying to get clear here. There's there's money. There's money. There's so much money that's being made with the vineyards. Why are you not doing a a level of bringing money in so we can do this? So we can create a sustainable plan. 
because we have to do this under Proposition 26, which does not allow to be charged more on a per use, charge extra money to some user versus the other. That's the state constitution. That's the box we have to play in. That's what we're required to do. Uh, the law requires that, and so that's what we have it, to follow. It doesn't have anything to do with Tom Dutton being there are president. People, there are people in line behind Dr. Dr. Schiff or anything like that. I'd be happy to discuss more with there, you afterwards. There are people in line behind you that need to speak. I haven't I spoken. No, I'd like you to finish. That's I, you do, you no, I, I, I'm learning by hearing you talk. Okay. I'd like <laughs> to hear you talk because you're filling in a lot of information I have not heard from them. Okay. And I'm an organic grower, and uh, everything you're saying, I'm behind. So I'd like her to have some of my time. Go for it. Take five more minutes. How much more do you need? <laughs> I'd like a whole meeting. There are, why, don't, why don't we let, there's another person in line here, why don't we let other, other folks who are waiting in line? She gave up her time, so I can try to remember. You've, you've already had two, two chances at the microphone. We need to make sure we hear from everybody. Hi, Vinny Martin, resident. Um, I have a couple questions. One is, is why don't you know what the fee is going to cost? I mean, this thing is supposed to be up and running in July. Why don't we have a number? That's a very big window that you have there. Yeah, uh, it's a good question. So we're keeping with the range because we're not done. There's a couple of uses that we're refining a little bit more now which will have an impact on defining what that is. But we've kind of done our best shot at what we think a worst case, best case range yeah. is, which I is get what that. we're providing. I get that. Well, why don't we wait? We wish we were done right now, but uh, we're not quite done. So that's where we are. I know, but we're, it's, it's going forward. Right. We don't have a cost yet. Yes, we will it's hard soon. To call. It's 16 bucks, okay. If it's 20 something, well, maybe no. I, I mean, it's, it's, I, I want to know why you don't have the, the amount figured out yet. Yeah. I understand your frustration. These things take time. I'm I wish I had a number for you. It's just a question. You. Why don't you? Because we're still in the middle of studying some of the numbers. So when we, when we did this, uh, as an example, so the Department of Water Resources has factors that we have to use. If we're, if we're going to push back on those factors, we have to have studies to found those. We can't just make numbers up. Well, I know. It's the same with the fire department thing. They, they don't give us a fee either. And they're, they're putting every, you know, they're uh, consolidating all the fire departments, which I'm not saying is a bad idea, but there's no, they don't have a number. And it just happens time and time again. Next question is, um, you, uh, you say in three years, you'll decide whether to... Uh, not charge us a fee anymore, <laughs> right? <laughs> or, or you may change it. Is there going to be meetings and discussions, or is that just going to be done? Yeah, I mean, it, it, there's going to be meetings the entire three years um, to managing the agency, and we'll be looking at those kinds of things as it gets closer, especially when the groundwater sustainability plan is done. There's going to be a lot of public input on that, and that's going to really drive what we need to do next. So I won't just read in the paper one day that the fee went up from $16 to $35. I hope not. You hope not? Yeah. That's, that's the second answer. That, yeah. Okay, so um, I was told by uh, uh, an employee that there would, and I heard in the presentation that there would not be meters put on our wells. Can you guarantee me that you will not ever put meters on our wells? I can tell you that uh, if, if you're a de minimis user, the law does not allow us to, even if we wanted to, and we don't. Okay. I just want to see if they would... Uh, Say that. I don't believe so when we, do you think the meters will be going on? The, when authorities. do you think we'll, we'll have to purchase the meters and put them on our wells to monitor our water use? I, 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 there was some talking. What could you say that again? I said, when do you think that we will have to purchase water meters, put them on our wells, and monitor our water use and report to the city? That is, that is your choice. We're not asking you to do that. Okay. Thank you. 
Jackie Mendoza, Sebastopol, and I'm deferring my time. Okay, so, so my question is, 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 one is the incentives to use less water, less herbicides, less pesticides. Where is that in your plan? My, well, quest my question basically is, is, is I'm looking at the ridiculousness of your plan, because dividing the need of how much money you need by the amount of people using wells comes up with a certain amount, right? So some people use 30 gallons a day. Some people use 3,000 gallons a day. How is that equitable? Is that a question you want me to answer? Sure. Okay. I'm, I'm totally confused. So I presented kind of the methodology and how it would sc it's scaled like that because we do uh, want to make sure it is equitable. And so the methodology we've come up with within the confines of Proposition 26 is what I presented today. So that's, that's how we're doing. So we have an acre foot charge for the users that have measured systems and we know how much they pump because they report it to the state and everybody else are based on estimated uses that are on founded studies that are available if you wanted to look at them. But it, it's just, it would be like getting a bill from PG&E and saying, well, everybody in your, in your city, you know, use this much. So we're dividing the amount of people in your city, and that's your bill. It's a, it, 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 doesn't, it, it doesn't work for me. I'm a business owner. And I'm trying to figure out where did that plan come from? Where is the root of that plan? Because I do not think in my heart of hearts that, that the minimal year users and the food producers of our county, the ones that we are going to rely on when we can't get any food anywhere else, need to pro be protected, not fined. And I think that our water should be protected. And you guys are, are, are asking, you basically have said that you want to spend three, you spent three million dollars, and you can't even, you don't even have teeth to say that you're going to say anything about herbicides being put into the water. Well, again, the plan has not been prepared. It's being prepared. But you spent $3 million. Ma'am, your, your time is up. Um, is there anybody else in the room who hasn't yet uh, given comment or asked questions that would like to do that? Um, I, see, I see someone standing. Got a couple folks. My name is Rue Furch and I'm a domestic well owner. That is to say, my house relies entirely on a well. And so everyone in the household basically has to have clean, fresh water all the time. And so sustainable water for me is critically important because we couldn't live there if it weren't for the well. Um, I wanted to make sure that in every hearing, there is notation made that um, the small family farms in Sonoma County are critical and have to be examined independently from other agricultural users. There have been a couple people who have alluded to that, but I want to make sure that it's in the record in that form. There was discussion at one of the GSA board meetings of having uh, a focused conversation with small farmers so that there could be um, greater understanding of the kinds and types of agriculture that use different amounts of water so that they'd be um, allocated f fees fairly because it's really critically important on a whole lot of levels that we grow locally. It, 
I mean, climate change and everything is really um, relative to that. And to the people who have been really distressed about the process so far, we have three years in which to write a plan that will do all the things that everybody is asking for and that we all rely upon. And I would ask that everybody who has, is here remain involved. You have to come to the meetings and say, you need to consider X, Y, and Z. My circumstance is whatever it is, and so this is gonna be different and it needs to be applied this way. If we're gonna have a full and comprehensive plan that deals with all of the issues of sustainability, the community has to remain involved. You can't just show up at these meetings and say it isn't working. You have to show up and say this is what would work, and I hope everybody here will do that. Hi, uh, my name is Marsh Harris, homeowner. Uh, my question is regarding determination of the vineyards owners and their wells that they uh, pull the water out. And I, I'm aware of one particular organization, corporation, that uses uh, two wells. They have a tanker, one and maybe two tankers all throughout the season hauling water out of the center of the plain to areas outside of, which was years ago was dry land farming. Now I was wondering in determination of how much water they're hauling out of the center of the plain and unfortunately is leaving the area, how are they determining how much water they'll be, uh, or fees they'll be paying based on that type of operation? It's very similar to the bottled water problem you discussed. <clears throat> so basically the records that we have is what we base the assessment on. So if, if it is a permitted operation to do that kind of thing, yes. then they will be assessed in that way. Well, so, how do you know, in other words, it's, how do you define or how do you determine how much water they're using in that well without a meter on it if it's being hauled elsewhere? In other words, I'm concerned that maybe they're paying uh, based on the number of acres of vineyard with the well and they have three times that somewhere else that they're also supplying with water. How would that work with your program? Well, I'm not quite sure, except that um, when the program is up and running and something's not accurate, we have the plan to move forward is to make our information more accurate. So if it is causing some of those six indicators to change where we've got an ability to come in and do something about it, that's one of the purposes of this agency. So the vineyard owner would come and tell you that I owe three times as much as I got a bill for. No, so I'm saying that, that if we are seeing issues in the area, whether it's depressed groundwater levels or water quality uh, changes, things like that, we have an ability to look at those issues and see if, if there's something that we need okay. to do about it. All righty, thank you. Are there others who haven't yet commented that would like to do so? I got a, a, a concise question that came to mind. Um, given the PG&E's decision to abandon the Potter Valley project, does, do you think that's putting the diversions from Neil River potentially in jeopardy or will that continue? And my thinking is that if the water agency is curtailed in how much it can, how much surface water it can get from the river, it might, um, cause increased dependence on groundwater for Rona Park and San Rosa for the, you know, track houses they want to build and apartments. So I, I don't want to see people, you know, being on the hook for, you know, pumping water down into the ground, which I, I heard as a possibility. And I want to know if, um, you know, this Potter Valley situation is playing into um, that potentially. Mm -hmm. 
the Potter Valley project um, is going to um, be a long, long process, both within the FERC process and the bankruptcy process. The last relicensing took about 50 years, but um, I think moving forward, when you look at the impacts here, the amount of water coming from the Potter Valley diversion itself uh, is fairly minimal down in this uh, impact. We have Lake Sonoma, which has a large supply of storage and also the remainder of inflows naturally um, into Lake Mendocino also within the Russian River watershed itself. So it's something to uh, continue to monitor and to adjust to and to participate in. It'll be a long process, but we have resiliency embedded into our systems. Uh, I think it's more important that we manage groundwater in conjunction with winter surface flows so that when we have naturally occurring droughts, if we're properly managing our groundwater, um, we'll be more resilient to any kind of um, changes either from management from a piece of it from Potter Valley or from natural climatic uh, changes. And Sigma, complying with Sigma is a big part of that overall regional resiliency. You guys are talking about the resiliency and everything, but yet what are we going to do to get the water back into the ground? What's your plans there? I mean, we can't keep going on like we are releasing into the ocean without either desalinization, getting the water back onto the land. We need to build some dams, inject the water into the caverns. Is there any, what about that? So those are things we're looking at. Um, we've done a pilot project for aquifer storage and recovery. We've also done some um, preliminary projects on stormwater recharge. All of those will be looked at and evaluated in each of the three basins, um, along with other measures like water conservation and other sources of water to come up with the best formula that fits the collective interests of this basin. So very much in the plans uh, and they will be uh, embodied there. We have done a lot of scientific work, us and our uh, partners uh, on this, and so that's definitely something we think about every day. And when environmentalists step in and say you can't do that? When the environmentalists step in and say you can't do that like they did five, six years ago, and then you sent all the water to the geysers? I'm not, I did not understand that. that quite. When who steps in? What's that? I did Environmentalists. Not. Environmentalists. I mean, every time you in? start to talk about putting water into the ground for future use, they seem to be able to stop, step in and stop you, and they stop the bridges from being built and flooding and all this, cleaning out the creeks. They're, how's that going to stop you guys? Well, I think that's part of this whole process is that everybody's got a perspective and we're going to come together in the plan and get the best balance. So there's going to be different points of view on all of this. Uh, but I think that there's uh, technically good ways and environmentally sound ways to recharge water. It's being done all over uh, the West and the world and, and there's new information available. So I think we'll find a way to do that here. But we've seen nothing in your plans as sustainability of doing it. We haven't still, talked about that one bit. We're still developing the. We haven't even um, developed the plan yet. That's, but that's that's, that's got to be part of it. Absolutely, I, I totally you, agree. You can't with you. say we're going to be sustainable if you don't have a way to save the water. We just sent how many billions of gallons out to the ocean. So we have, we have one more person in line, I think, waiting to comment, and we only have a few more minutes um, before the end of the meeting. So I think, uh, I think we're going to, to need to keep moving unless, um, unless anybody up there is, is dying to, um, uh, to give another answer. It's just 
every time you guys don't want an answer, you, you just hush up up there, and that's what you've done at the last meeting. Oh, we don't want to answer that. Well, we don't have a plan yet. Well, you're, you've been working on the plan for two years. It doesn't take that long. I've got proper, property in three other states, and we do it. It's not rocket science. It's not that hard. Sir, we're going to have to keep moving. Thank you for your comments. Howdy. Uh, my name is Jamie Ziegler. Can you clarify if you're going to use the groundwater basin boundary or the watershed basin boundary of the groundwater basin for the assessment? Groundwater basin. The groundwater basin. Okay. I should get up and leave because I'm technically outside and I don't really believe that that boundary is actually, it's a political line. Doesn't really make sense. I, I, anyway, but I'm going to make a couple other comments. Um, it seems that uh, it would be reasonable to ask you all to defer based on other people's comments what you're doing until you provide a detailed, um, basically, an assessment on every parcel. A list of the parcel numbers and the proposed fee that you're proposing. Um, number two, you're looking for a million dollars. You have two. I would get to work because if you get a draft plan, it's going to answer a lot of these questions. If you need money to get through the last year, come back in two years. But right now, you're kind of winging it in my opinion, on the fee. You got farmers that are going to potentially get assessed a lot of money. Um, I don't know if that stuff can, those fees, your fees with respect to this can trigger CEQA, but I don't know if anyone's looked into that, but CEQA gets triggered on everything else. So I don't know why a fee that's going to, you know, generate this kind of money, and the other thing uh, wouldn't trigger that. The other thing I would say is you pointed out that um, 17,000 acre feet are extracted, and you're using that for the basis of the fee, but I pulled out of the 2014 study here, and the number here is 35,000. So that's, I'm just going to say, that's a big difference. You could end up with a windfall of millions of dollars. So I think the way to resolve all this and alleviate everyone's concern that happens to be in the basin is to provide that APN number and the fee that you're proposing so people can specifically know the financial impact and, you know, and you'll know how much money you think you're going to raise. And then my final comment is... Sir, why don't, why don't we give Andy a chance to answer that question, and then I think we have to move to the next person so we are sure that we have a chance to hear from everybody. Okay, I'm going to make one more comment. I don't think you have the authority under this. I, I read the Sustainable the Management Act here. It seems like you're piggybacking some other things on this. And so you got to stay focused on finance, I guess, and fees. But you want people to like sign up and start volunteering information. Don't go down that road, is my suggestion. You got to come up with your plan. And the plan, you can do those types of things. But it's kind of like the, the cart's way before the horse. Thank you. So I'll just answer a couple things. You know, I mean, well, the thirty-five thousand—that's for—that's the uh, estimated extraction for the entire watershed. The seventeen thousand is specific to the groundwater basin. Okay. Well, I mean, I happen to believe that if it's it's watershed based, it could end up like that. So, if you're unequitably charging people in the basin for a plan that you're going to apply to everyone in the watershed, then that's not fair either. 
So you kind of need to know where the plan's going before you start levying fees. And there's a lot of uh, verbiage in the act about what you can do with the fees and things, but a lot of it is contingent on a plan. So your time's up, so I think we need money. to let Andy finish answering your questions um, and then the wrap plan. up the meeting. So I, I just want to acknowledge and appreciate your, your um, suggestion of providing the parcels information and things like that. We actually are developing a means to do that. So um, I appreciate hearing that. So, so I think it's reasonable f before you ask for the, to do this part of the process that's outlined in the Management Act that you provide that as you're required to in the act. So that's the kind of information that should have been brought to this. Sir, then, your comments your comments have been made and heard. Oh, um, okay. And, and so. I would, we were, he was engaging me in discussion. I don't see anyone else here, but I'll, okay. nice meeting you. All right, we can talk Thanks. after. Is there anyone, we have just, just the last couple minutes here, so if it, it, I don't see anybody else rising who hasn't yet had the chance to make comments. Um, I do apologize for having to, to cut off some of the time, but we want to make sure that we get everybody out at the time that we promised. Um, so I think I'm going to just wrap up with a few logistics. Um, Rue made a great comment about staying involved, and so I want to make sure I, I remind everybody um, the different ways to stay engaged in this. Um, there was an email sign-up list um, when you came in, if you're not on the email list for this yet. So if you signed up for emails, you'll be added to the mailing list. If you don't receive a confirmation email that you're signed up, um, please uh, go onto the uh, website, sandarosaplaingroundwater.org, and um, watch for ads, press releases, check the website, um, because there will be lots more opportunities for involvement, um, advisory committee meetings, board meetings, and, and public meetings such as these. Um, thank you all for coming. I know that uh, you gave a lot of time out of your evening. We really appreciate uh, your questions and your comments and the dialogue that occurred tonight. And if you have more questions and comments, um, there will be uh, staff and advisory committee members that are sticking around uh, for the next few minutes after this meeting. So uh, please feel free to stay around and ask more questions. Thank you.